Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arthritis Talks. I'm Dr. Sean Bevan, Chief Science Officer at the Arthritis Society. Thank you for joining us tonight. While we've come together for this event from many different places, I would like to acknowledge the land on which I am located on, on which our Toronto office stands, is the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations, Anishinaabek, Huron Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous people. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampoon Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee, <clears throat> Anishinaabek, and Allied Nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this meeting place is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Today, we are very fortunate to welcome back spine surgeon, Dr. Raj Raprasad, and physiotherapist, Marcia Coriali from the Shoulder Arthritis Research Institute, who are here to answer some of the most common questions we receive about arthritis in the back and neck. Before we get started, a few logistics. This webinar is best viewed on a laptop or desktop computer. If you have technical difficulties, please email arthritistalks at arthritis.ca for assistance. If you have a question for our presenters, you can submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom middle of the screen. We will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can during the hour that we have together. You can click on the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to access the chat and connect with other participants as well as the Arthritis Society's chat, chat moderator. If you would like to close the chat completely, just click the red X icon to close out of the window. We're pleased to provide captioning of our webinars to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience, and you'll see that running along the bottom of the page. Many of the questions that we received did follow similar themes, so we'll address those first before going into the live Q&A at the end of the session. And before we get started, I want to thank our event partners, Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, and other partners for their financial support of our Arthritis Talks series. So with that, let's get started. A warm welcome to Dr. Rampersad and Marcia. Dr. Rampersad, let's start us off. Could you first give us some insight about how arthritis actually affects the back and the neck? Sure thing. Thanks, Sean. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for, for joining us. So um, probably the bigger aspect of this is, is uh, arthritis affects the spine in both the neck and the low back, more commonly the low back. And as you, the older you are, the more likely it is to be arthritis causing back pain or neck pain rather than things like a pulled muscle or strained sprain from lifting something. That can certainly happen. It doesn't matter what your age is. But as we, as we do get older, um, like these gray hairs in my head and my beard, um, the arthritis uh, is more likely to be the cause of your low back pain and the cause of your neck pain. And low back pain itself is the number one cause of disability um, on the planet year after year. So low back pain is, is quite common and arthritis is, is likely the most commonest cause uh, with regards to um, degeneration of the back. So in the low back, it can present, uh, as this slide is showing, with arthritis in what's called the facet joint. So those red areas on the image on the right. And those tend to hurt more when you're standing upright or walking. Whereas if you have arthritis in your disc, that tends to hurt more when you're bending forward or sitting. The areas you can see on the left are basically um, areas where the pain can go. So it's not always right across the back. It can be across, it can be on one side, it can go to your bum, it can go to your thigh, and it can even go to the front. So the pain can be in a variety of areas. And some folks will also have pain in their low back, but also in their hip. And there's no rule that says it can't be back arthritis and hip arthritis happening together, which isn't uncommon. The next slide. The one difference with arthritis that affects the back and the neck compared to say arthritis that affects my hand that you keep seeing flash across the screen or uh, your hip or your knee is the nerves run through the middle of the spine. And when arthritis forms bone spurs, like it does in other joints, if you have a large bone spur in your knuckle or your knee, 
you can see that you don't see that in the spine or spine arthritis because it's much deeper than your skin but these bone spurs can grow and then cause what's called stenosis which is narrowing of the space for the nerves and if that gets significant enough it'll start to pinch the nerve and if depending on which nerve it's pinching um it'll go down your leg when you're standing or walking or in certain positions and then in the next slide so that's the one part of arthritis in the neck or the low back that is different than arthritis in other joints is the same process is happening but because the nerves are also right beside those joints they get affected and that's why sometimes you'll have pain down your arm or pain down your leg based on the arthritis so that's a, a an additional burden that arthritis of the back or neck adds to those who suffer from it it can go beyond the back or neck and affect the nerves which then affects the the limb so you have pain down your arm you can have numbness you can have tingling if we go to the next slide um, and weakness even in the arm when it's more severe and if it's in your neck it can literally also press on your spinal cord. So sometimes arthritis in the, in the spine can cause a condition that affects your spinal cord that can then affect your balance and your strength and can be quite a, a serious uh, emergency. And that does happen, um, but typically it's often preceded by neck pain or, or arthritis signs, but they're getting worse. So if you start having pain in your neck or your back, and then all of a sudden you're getting numbness down your legs or arms, those are signs to definitely see someone um, sooner rather than later if you're getting associated symptoms into your arms or into your legs, or you're losing balance or unable to function because not just because of pain in your neck or your back, but your limbs don't seem to be working in, in at the same time. Next slide. So thank you for that, Raj. That's a lot of complex related symptoms altogether. So what, what are the treatment options for people who are experiencing arthritis in their back and neck? Yeah. By far, 80% of people, it's pain. So in the sense of the symptoms, there are these other complex ones and you need to be aware of them, but the majority of folks, it's about pain. And the majority of treatment is the active active uh, diagram on the right was which is uh, labeled conservative care it's about trying to move trying to be healthy trying to be active trying to be fit so as your joints get arthritic the, if your muscles are weak and they're not supporting your joints it puts more stress on the joints um, excess weight especially if you're heavy but your muscles are strong the weight isn't the issue it's more the load so it's a balance between ideal ideal weight and strength you can lose 100 pounds, but if your muscles are weak, you're going to actually potentially have more pain. So it's about healthy um, um, activity, good strength to support the muscles, and then that supports and, uh, and offloads the spinal joints that get arthritic. So it's similar to what you need to do for other joints, very much so in that majority, 90 plus percent of our patients, unless they have those very specific neurological symptoms, Really, it's about um, conservative care, similar approaches that you would take to your knee or your hip. Medications can help when things aren't going well, but we always try to maximize non-pharmacological care. Um, medications such as Tylenol, uh, um, if you can't take an anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatories are often the ideal uh, medication if you need a pain medication most people can deal without there are uh, also other aspects non-medical med medicines so naturopathic anti-inflammatories foods we'll get to that in a minute sometimes if the arthritis uh, and symptoms don't respond to these things which is the majority of people it does then injections of cortisone like you would in your knee or your shoulder can be a treatment for spine arthritis um, and that usually has to be done guided with an x-ray machine so they know they're getting the injection right into the arthritic joint and trying to identify which one is hurting because if i did an mri on everybody even you know uh in their in their mid 50s like me 60 per 60 to 65 percent 
will have significant arthritis throughout the spine. If you're in your 70s, it's 80%, et cetera. So arthritis is there, but it doesn't mean it necessarily hurts. And that this is the numbers for if you have no symptoms in your spine, you would still have imaging that would show some degree of arthritis. And that sometimes can be confusing. Surgery is reserved for those neurological symptoms that we spoke about early. And less than 10% of people with arthritis of their spine ultimately um, may end up requiring surgery. So it's, it's the least common uh, outcome for arthritis of the spine uh, because many uh, individuals, if it's back pain or neck pain and it's arthritis diffusely, even if they want surgery because the pain can be horrible, um, surgery doesn't actually fix that particular pain. Surgery is really good at unpinching nerves or the spinal cord and relieving the neurological symptoms or the arm symptoms or the leg symptoms. It can help with the back pain or neck pain symptoms, but that's less predictable. So surgery is reserved for a, a subgroup of patients. And generally speaking, it's less than 10 people ultimately likely end up having surgery. I know it's a long answer, but there's a lot of issues. <laughs> and, and so exercise and also appropriate diet. So there are things in your diet that are essentially antioxidants and anti pro or sorry, anti inflammatory type of, of foods, um, such as demonstrated here, um, can be helpful. And the thing with diet, though, also medications, it works in some and doesn't work with others. So it's one of these things where you do have to try uh, certain things and uh, the evidence supports that it works, but it does also support that it doesn't work in everyone. So it's a bit of um, trial and error and, you know, but certainly um, foods that are um, antioxidants or anti-inflammatory in nature um, are, are the ones that you definitely need to consider as part of your approach to managing uh, and treating your arthritis of your, your back or your neck or anywhere else for that matter. Okay, Marcia, let's bring you into this conversation now. Um, we have received a number of questions around non-surgical options to reduce that pain in your back and your neck. So I see that you're ready. Can you give us some simple exercises that our attendees can try that might help them manage their pain? And Marcy, I'm sorry, I think you're still on mute from earlier. There we go. Perfect. Um, yes, I can. So I actually have um, my father-in-law here with me today. Um, he is 75 years old and he has arthritis in his back, um, in his neck, um, in his shoulders, his knees, um, and his hips. Um, he also has fibromyalgia. Um, and so he, he's been doing these simple exercises to really help uh, manage his arthritis. Um, and I'm just going to show you some of the things that you can start with. So the first exercise um, that we always sort of start off with for patients with a diagnosis of back arthritis is something called a posterior pelvic tilt. Um, and this exercise really helps to strengthen the muscles of the abdominals, and it really helps to engage that core musculature, which helps to support the spine. So in a lying down position uh, with your knees uh, bent like this, what you want to do is you want to uh, flatten your low back uh, into the bed and tilt your pelvis up um, so you're um, uh, drawing your abdominals into your spine and you're tilting your pelvis so that your uh, low back is flattened into the bed. So you can do this in a standing position just like the way I'm showing you or you can do it in a lying down position the way uh, my father-in-law here is showing you. So he's tilting his pelvis up and he's flattening his low back uh, into the bed. You can hold this position for about five seconds and you can repeat this uh, 10 times. And again, remember to relax, uh, take a deep breath in. Um, and as you're contracting, remember to keep breathing um, and not holding your breath. So that exercise is a strengthening exercise to again, get your core muscles engaged. And it can be a starter exercise that you can do if you're first diagnosed. 
Um, another exercise you can do is stretching your low back. Um, so you can bring your knee uh, into your chest. You can do one leg at a time uh, or both legs. However, some patients who have um, knee arthritis may find it hard to put pressure on their knees, um, or they may not have the ability to just uh, pull their uh, hip into um, their chest. So in that case, we recommend using a towel, placing that uh, under your knee. You'll get a little bit more uh, range of motion, and you can bring your knee into your chest uh, while keeping it supported. Again, you want to breathe through this exercise, some deep breaths in, um, a 30-second hold so that you're really stretching out some of those uh, tissues to take some of that load off of the spine. And then you can repeat that again uh, on the other side. You can do uh, one leg uh, at a time uh, just as a warm-up just to get you started uh, so you get some flexibility um, in your spine. And then as you get that flexibility um, uh, up, you can progress to uh, both legs. Now we're gonna just have both knees into the spine. Perfect, just like that. And again, a 30 second hold, breathing through the exercises, uh, not holding your breath, just sort of relaxing and really feeling that stretch uh, through the low back area and taking some of that pressure off of the spine. Um, another stretching exercise uh, that's uh, typically also prescribed is something in sitting. So I'm just going to have you uh, sit up and just uh, uh, rest your legs uh, on the stool here. So if you're um, having pain in your low back from uh, walking for a long time or standing for a long time, you can take that pressure off of your back uh, by sitting in a chair um, and then reaching down uh, to touch the floor. What you would do is you uh, would hold on to your ankles and really just pull on your ankles to get a little bit more uh, uh, of a stretch. And then you want to round your back here. And this is a good position uh, to engage in um, if you want to take some of that pressure off the spine. We have a lot of patients who, you know, they say, I, I can't walk for an hour without stopping to take a break. So sometimes they will walk for 20 minutes. They'll find a park bench to sit on. Um, they'll do this sort of stretch, um, and then they continue their walking. You may need to repeat this uh, three to five times, uh, but again, you can continue uh, doing this exercise. So those are some uh, simple exercises that you can do uh, for your uh, low back. Um, and now I'm going to have you, I'm going to have my father-in-law demonstrate some simple exercises uh, for the neck. So with the neck, so this one second, he's, he's already so eager. Right? He's been practicing these exercises already. Um, so with your neck, um, a lot of times, you know, um, we're in this sort of like hunched forward posture. Our shoulders are all rounded. Our head is uh, protruded forward. So what we want to do is we want to do something uh, called a neck retraction, where we actually uh, bring our neck uh, backwards to strengthen some of these uh, muscles in the front of our neck to, again, give some support. So in this position, you want to just bring your head back and just sort of tuck your chin under. And again, you're strengthening some of these muscles in your neck, and then you just want to relax. Perfect. And then again, do that again. So again, tucking your chin back. And you'll feel a little bit of a contraction in this uh, front muscle here uh, in front of your neck. And then your neck is connected uh, to your shoulders. And so you're not only going to bring your uh, neck back, but you also want to round your shoulders back. So round your shoulders back and squeeze your shoulder blades together. So this is another exercise you can perform. You can do it with the neck uh, tuck exercise, um, or you can do it separately. About a five-second uh, count. And then again, you can repeat this uh, 10 times. Perfect. Um, so that's a neck strengthening exercise and an a upper back strengthening exercise where you're squeezing your shoulder blades back and you're also tucking your head back. So now I'm going to have my father-in-law uh, turn and face the camera. So I'm going to have you just uh, sit, turn this way. And I'm going to have you sit facing the camera here. So if you have pain that's actually uh, going down your arm, uh, these are a couple of exercises that are also uh, beneficial. So if you have a constant pain, uh, a burning sensation going down your arm, 
what you want to do is you want to actually take uh, the pressure off of your arm. So as Dr. Rambersod explained, um, when you have pain radiating down your arm, it's usually because there's a pinched nerve in your neck. And so by putting your hand uh, on your head, it's usually a position of relief. It can take that pressure uh, off of the nerve and it gives your uh, arm a sense of uh, uh, relief. You can also um, put your hand and rest it on the opposite shoulder um, or support it uh, with the other hand. Um, and then finally, uh, as Dr. Rampersad uh, explained, um, if there's a pinched nerve at the side of the neck, this is usually from uh, stenosis. And so that nerve is pinched. So one of the exercises that you can do is you wanna stretch uh, away from the side of pain. So you're stretching towards uh, the opposite side and you're opening up this area here where that nerve is being pinched. You're stretching out that musculature. You're holding that for about 30 seconds and you can repeat that three times. So these are just some simple exercises uh, that you can start doing if you um, are looking to manage your uh, low back or your neck arthritis. Thank you so much, Marcia. Thank you also to your father-in-law who literally brought the images to life there for us. Um, we've also received a number of questions tonight about sleeping. So. Can, are there specific sleeping positions that you can re recommend that will help reduce that pain in your back and your neck? And again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get you to go off mute again, if you could. Sure, so we are gonna demonstrate some sleeping positions. I do have a slide for this as well. But one of the things we recommend is the Goldilocks principle. Um, so not too high, not too low, uh, but just right. So um, in terms of uh, neck positioning, you're looking for a pillow um, that gives you adequate support so that your neck is not in a position that is uh, elevated too high, um, nor is your neck um, extended uh, back either. You want to have the neck uh, rested in a, in a neutral position. Um, you can also use um, a lumbar roll um, or, um, or a, a roll towel if you're um, in a sideline position. Um, can we bring up the slides for sleep postures, please? Perfect. Perfect. Go back one. Perfect, so this is, this is exactly the principle I was speaking about. So if you look through these slides, the Goldilocks principle of not too high, not too low, but just right, you can see if you're lying on your back, you don't want a pillow that's gonna have your neck extended up into this sort of flexed position, nor do you want a pillow that's gonna extend you back into this extended position. You really want your neck um, in a neutral position without putting that strain um, in either direction. And that's the same for your back. Uh, you want to, again, not have a mattress that's going to be too soft um, and kind of give way too much, nor have a mattress uh, that's going to be too hard. You're looking for something that's going to um, adjust to sort of the natural curves uh, in your spine. If you do have stenosis uh, in one area, sometimes uh, you may actually need to sleep um, on the opposite side of the area of stenosis, uh, particularly if that's uh, in the neck. And then lastly, um, the spine is not in isolation. Uh, you also have to uh, keep your hips and your knees uh, in a neutral position. Uh, so the use of a body pillow uh, between uh, the knees and sometimes even uh, for the shoulder uh, can be beneficial. Uh, for those that uh, can't sleep on their side, maybe because of a hip uh, uh, bursitis or a shoulder arthritis, um, or if they use a CPAP machine, uh, lying on your back uh, with a supportive pillow um, and sometimes a knee, uh, pillow underneath your knees uh, can also be a good position uh, for you to sleep in. Great, thank you so much, Marcia. So before we get into the Q&A this evening, Raj, we have received some questions about the impact of COVID-19 on surgeries in particular and wait times for surgeries. And we know that so many people have experienced their delays. So I just wonder if you could share some of your own thoughts about these surgical backlogs and you know what we are now experiencing. 
Sure. Uh, we don't have enough time, but <laughs> it's it's a challenge, and 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 folks unfortunately are deteriorating. So what has been shown is that while you're waiting, especially if your symptoms are bad enough that you were to that point where you're considering surgery or surgery was recommended, and then you have a prolonged wait, there's no question that you deteriorate. So one of the key things, if you are in that position, is to try to maintain as much activity. And one of the, the, the final recommendations with exercises is a concept of similar to the Goldilocks, but what we call directional preference, where go in the direction that hurts the least. So if some of the pelvic tilts that Marcia demonstrated, for some people, depending on where their arthritis is, they actually have to go in the opposite direction. So it's one of these things where the exercises should be modified, but while you're waiting for surgery, if you're waiting, try to be as active as possible. A lot of folks who have this condition, especially now with the summer, feel much better in a pool um, and exercising in a pool, even if it's walking back and forth. Because if you allow more and more deconditioning to occur, you then have a long, likely have a longer recovery for surgery and it does impact you. Um, in the sense of how are we managing those wait times and surgical backlogs, advocacy, speaking, uh, using your voice, uh, speaking to your, your local uh, government, every province is going through different phases of recovery. And right now, finally in Ontario, after two years, I would say for, for our spinal surgeries, at least at my hospital, we've finally gotten some extra resources. So it's hit and miss really depending on where you are where the institution was in regards to the different phases of COVID in the different provinces. Um, so the best thing, uh, if you're in that position, is, is truly using your voice as an advocate for um, what is what is a significant uh, issue that has only been made worse by, by COVID. And for many, have worsened while waiting because the access to the activities that did keep them going, going to a pool, being the social aspects of being together with their friends and going for walks or going to Pilates, whatever it is they, they were able to do that allowed them to not just exercise, but also have that social networking. Um, that's all been taken away for so many people. And the negative impact of that is compounding all of these things. So it's not just about the weight. It's about all the other things that went on top of that that have made the situation uh, that much worse or so uh, in one word advocacy is the only tool we have thank you Th thank you both Raj and Marcia for sharing all of your knowledge so far I'm going to turn it over to the Q&A from the questions that we just received uh, the first question I'm going to ask actually there's elements directed to both of you so this is from somebody who has just been diagnosed with arthritis in the back by x-ray so Raj, maybe I can ask you first, what can they expect next in terms of medical tests or interventions? And then Marcia, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you could give some thought to what should they be doing now? So to Raj, maybe you first. Sure, it's a great question. It really comes down to the symptom. Is it pain in the back? What direction does it go in? Um, if you just take an x-ray for other reasons, you will see arthritis in your back. So sometimes folks get diagnosed with arthritis but they actually have no pain in that joint. And it just, uh, and that's more the arthritis of aging as it were, versus there are different forms of arthritis. Inflammation plays a big part we know. So some people have arthritis in their forties or even younger. So it's really dependent on the nature of the symptoms as to what comes next and why the x-ray was being done in the first place. Typically it is for pain. And then the nature of that pain will dictate whether or not more testing is needed. So if you do have neurologic symptoms, like we talked about, that small percentage of people who do, then yes, that should move on to something further, such as a CAT scan or even an MRI. If it's just pain in the back, 99% of the time, that just needs exercise and modification. And I'll pass that uh, part of the question to, to Marcia. Yeah, so um, as Dr. Rampersad said, your, um, your diagnosis, your imaging, it doesn't define your function. 
Um, you can have back arthritis just like my father-in-law and you could be an avid pickleball player. And so it, it doesn't necessarily stop you from Nordic pole walking or pickleballing or, you know, participating in, in the activities that you love. Um, what you want to do is you want to look at, you know, what exercises uh, can you do and you want to actually start doing them, making them part of your regular activity. So maybe these are things that you do every morning um, or every evening or both uh, for 20 minutes. Some of these starter exercises uh, to strengthen your low back, to strengthen your neck, uh, to stretch your low back, to stretch your neck. Um, and then you want to look at what you're doing and maybe what's aggravating it and think about how you can modify it. So if going for long walks is something that you feel um, is painful, can you modify it? Meaning, can you take frequent breaks? Um, can you use uh, Nordic poles when you're walking um, to sort of give you a little bit more support or to take some of that pressure off of your spine? Um, can you find another activity like the pool um, or even the bike? Uh, recumbent biking is another great activity. Uh, if you still want to get that cardiovascular fitness, um, but not have that same pressure through your spine, um, that would be another great activity. And um, even some, for some people, it may be even common things like, you know, I can't uh, cook, I can't iron. Um, and so even um, thinking about how you can take the pressure off your spine with that. So uh, for those patients, I usually tell them, you know, put your foot up on a stool. Um, and so that sort of takes some of that pressure off of your low back in a standing position. So, um, you know, starting with some sort of modifications. And if you need a little bit more guidance, you know, seeing someone like myself, a healthcare uh, professional who can do an assessment on you, give you some exercises and give you some strategies on how you can uh, self-manage your condition is probably another way uh, you can go. Great. Uh, Marcy, I have a couple of questions here for you in particular. Are any of the exercises that you just showed, would they ever not be recommended for somebody who has recently had surgery? So it depends. <laughs> um, it really depends on, you know, what surgery they've had. Um, is, this, is this exercise going to aggravate uh, their condition? Um, these are sort of like general exercises that I uh, sort of demonstrated for someone who may have a new onset of arthritis, who is looking to, you know, do some do something uh, proactive to get um, them strengthened and to stretch out uh, their muscles. But it really depends on your uh, presentation. Um, and if you've recently had surgery, it really also depends on the type of surgery and maybe also what the surgeon has sort of recommended as the post-operative uh, recovery for that uh, procedure. Okay, so to follow up on that, are there particular exercises that you could uh, recommend for people who have recently had hip replacement surgery? Um, so with that question, um, it, it sometimes depends on uh, the approach that the surgeon took. Um, if they took an anterior approach uh, or a lateral approach, uh, it depends on which muscles uh, were affected during the actual surgery. It also depends on when, where they are in their post-operative uh, recovery. So there's a set of exercises that you would do from like say zero to six weeks um, to sort of get those muscles um, sort of firing again, get them contracting. Um, and then as those muscles build strength, you then sort of progress uh, to more um, advanced exercises that are, you know, body weight um, and maybe with uh, a little bit more weight uh, added to them. And then after after three three months, you progress to another set of exercises. So it really depends on where they are in their post-operative uh, stage um, and also what their functional goals are, what they want to get back to. Do they want to get back to walking? Do they want to get back to sports? Um, and that's going to also depend on how long their rehab is going to be because you're going to have to progress the exercises to get back to a sports-specific uh, function. But a common exercise that, that's typically prescribed um, are glute uh, medius strengthening exercises. Um, and those are um, uh, a simple one is sometimes a clamshell uh, exercise. Uh, sometimes it's single leg stance uh, exercises. Sometimes they're like um, over a step um, and you're sidestepping over a step. And then obviously um, as you as you progress with that, you'll be doing something like side lunges. So there's a whole spectrum and a whole progression uh, depending on uh, the patient's uh, goal. Great. Yeah, so when, Dr. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Rush. The one thing I would add, regardless of the surgery you're having, uh, spine, hip, knee, 
being as fit as you can going into the surgery, as I said, particularly with weights, et cetera, not allowing yourself to be overly deconditioned. Of course, there's some things you can't do, and that's why you're having the surgery in the first place. But there's usually things you can find to do. And also trying to learn how to do some of the exercises, even in a limited manner, so that when you do have to do them after surgery, you're familiar with them, you're not trying to learn them for the first time. That's really important to help facilitate your your um, recovery from surgery, regardless of what it is. That's great, great advice. Um, so a few questions here, Dr. Rampersad, about symptoms. So yes. can pain in your tailbone, first of all, can that be arthritis? Um, it's not directly, but secondarily. And what I mean by that is a lot of the muscles in the low back come down and attach right to the base of your, your sacrum or your tailbone area. And if you're having muscle spasm in your back for a variety of reasons, um, then it can hurt right down in the tailbone. Now, if you fell and, and injured your tailbone, um, then that's that's a different type of arthritis where it's a, either a crack in that bone and it starts to move and it can hurt. So there are different reasons to have pain in your tailbone, but in the sense of it being arthritis, it's usually secondary to just having pain in the muscles and where those muscles attach. So it can be around your sacroiliac joint, it can be right down to the, to the tailbone area. And then that area just becomes intense. It's like having tennis elbow where the muscles attach to the side of your elbow. Uh, that's a lot of the muscles in the back attach to, to certain points and those points can start to hurt. Okay. And what about um, arthritis in the neck? And how does that contribute to symptoms like headache, nausea, vertigo? Um, and is there anything people can do to avoid those kinds of symptoms? Great question. Um, the headaches, absolutely. So if you get tension, similar thing to, to the other end, the tailbone question, if you get um, a spasm in your neck muscles, it goes right up to the base of your head typically, what we call an occipital headache, which is right at the back. It can, can go right to the front as well. Doesn't usually go right to the eyes. So what we call headaches that are here tend to be from different things, but it's right in the back. So so-called tension headache is often from either stress or just being tired for the day, but uh, with arthritis, definitely. And the best thing for that is usually things um, some of the exercises that Marcia uh, showed where you're trying to take the tension off of those muscles, uh, heat and trying to relax those muscles, getting your shoulders not in this position, but back and things like massage and acupuncture have both been shown to be very effective at releasing that muscle. So the key thing is, is trying to remove that tension. And a lot of time it happens because of posture. And then if you spend a whole lot of time on a phone uh, with texting and your neck down or iPad, et cetera, then that posture is usually not conducive to, to a happy neck uh, or, or happy muscles. In the sense of nausea, vertigo, um, that is usually not from neck arthritis. So that's something, if that's what the individual is experiencing, they should definitely be speaking to their, to their family doctor. Um, especially if it's with rapid movement of the neck, if the world is spinning, so if they're getting true vertigo, then that's usually an inner ear problem or another issue. It's not typically from spine arthritis. Okay. And Marcia, um, Dr. Rampersad just touched on some of this, but this is someone who has severe pain in their neck and really is having trouble moving side to side. So what are some other recommendations that you would have in terms of exercises for people who are experiencing severe neck pain? Yeah, so um, sometimes too, like with when you can't move side to side and there's stiffness, sometimes you know you're you need to sort of um, kind of warm those joints up a little bit. So sometimes you know first applying um, heat um, either through like a moist uh, towel that you put in the microwave and then you uh, put on your skin a hot water bottle. They do have some of these wraps that you can sort of put around your neck that deliver heat. So kind of just getting yourself a little bit relaxed uh, first could be a start. Um, and then the neck is connected to the shoulder. So sometimes you may actually have to start loosening up your shoulders first. So like, you know, shrugging your shoulders back, 
bringing your bringing your shoulder uh, bringing your shoulder blades back, so squeezing them back together. So again, like kind of working where you're um, stretching a little bit below the joint, um, and then and then actually going into some of those chin tuck exercises that I recommended, where you're uh, going back and forth. You can then also do movements like where you're going side to side, and just you know gently as as far as you can go. You can use your hand. Uh, to assist you. Sometimes you can also work on even just strengthening some of those muscles. So by pressing your hand um, into your head and you can go in different directions to strengthen the muscles in the front, strengthen the muscles in the side, strengthen the muscles in the back and sort of kind of kind of just sort of do a little bit um, every day. And then that will um, or it should help with some of the stiffness that you're having. Sometimes it's not going to move the first day. You're going to have to give it you know, a little bit every single day um, to kind of get it moving, but if you if you start with something gentle um, and sort of um, you know do a little bit you know five minutes every day, you can gradually increase that to ten minutes, um, and then hopefully that'll help with some of that uh, movement. And you know one of our biggest sayings in physiotherapy is uh, motion is lotion, and so you know if you try to move it, you will lubricate that joint, and you can and you can get your neck moving. You can even start laying down or on a recliner if it being upright like Marcy is at the moment, it's putting a lot of tension and it hurts more, try it moving it in different positions. So Marcy, is somebody- Yeah, and just, yeah, yeah. I was just gonna add to that thing. Actually, that's with, that's with everything, right? Like yeah, if, exactly. if, it, if, it, if, it's, if it's pain, if it, hurt, if it hurts and, it, and it's painful, how can we modify it, right? So if the exercise in standing hurts, let's try it in sitting. If it's in sitting, it hurts, let's try it in lying. If we can't do it on our back, maybe we can do it on our side. So like, let's always try to modify uh, the exercise. Well, so building on that, somebody here has asked, does it help to do any of these exercises in a hot shower? So maybe in the hot shower, maybe a little bit dangerous, uh, just depending on if you've got soap and it's a slippery floor. Um, but I definitely always recommend like, you know, after a hot shower, um, sometimes um, you're warm, and when you come out, definitely can do some of that stretching. If you were to be in that hot, hot shower and start stretching, like putting one leg up, you know, a slip and fall could happen. And so I definitely recommend that for when you get out. Uh, definitely do some of the stretching exercises uh, in particular for the neck, uh, the shoulders, the upper neck, the low back. Um, you're a little bit more loosened then, um, and you probably uh, will feel a little bit more relaxed, and you can probably get into a deeper stretch. Yeah, the other thing you can do right at the beginning um, is applying heat. It doesn't mean once a day. It can be five minutes on the hour. So you do it for five minutes. You do a little bit of range of motion, whichever the joint is. You do a little more heat after. Then you do go on whatever it is you need to do, and you do it again. Um, so it, it's inconvenient, but for some, they need to break it up. They, they often try to do everything at once because that's how our brain thinks, okay, we need to be efficient. We need to do this and get on with it. Breaking exercise up into three or four times a day, even five minutes at a time, is something that's another good strategy. Little bits accumulate over time is often the best way to start. Thank you, Dr. Rampersad. <clears throat> so uh, back to these neurological symptoms, um, are there, you talked a little bit about surgery, but are there ways to deal with tingling in the fingers, toes, neck that people are feeling related to arthritis? Yeah, it, it often they will resolve with the improvement of the pain and the symptoms. So if you're, especially in the neck and sometimes in the back, if everything is under spasm, well, it puts more pressure on everything. So we see a lot of, especially if you have a lot of tension in your neck in the side, um, and that stiffness once as the muscles relax and the, the motion starts and there's better movement, a lot of folks can improve those symptoms without ever um, needing surgery. So unless somebody has loss of function, progression, um, you know, they, they're unable to walk, they're unable to do anything, and it's rapidly happening, that's when surgery, there is no stop. You have to, it, it, it's something that's more emergent or urgent. Majority of symptoms, if it's just numbness or it's starting, uh, we always try conservative care in these uh, efforts that we're discussing prior to surgery. So there's always a period of that because in the majority of individuals, it actually improves to the point where it's manageable. Just having numbness alone, which is a common concern, 
something bad is happening, uh, if the nerve is irritated, it can be numb. But does that mean you're going to get paralyzed, end up in a wheelchair, lose control? Pretty much 99% of the time, no, unless things are progressing, progressing, progressing. So progression and worsening of those types of symptoms is what's key. A lot of folks can have numbness in their hands because of carpal tunnel. You can have numbness for other reasons. And as we get older, you can have numbness in your hands and feet from things like diabetes, B12 deficiencies, certain medications. So numbness in and of itself is something that can come from a variety of things and that does need a, a bit of a, a workup sometimes. But trying the exercises typically is always uh, safe, especially in the way that we're discussing them. Um, so it's not a no pain, no gain kind of situation. You have to modify and find the right thing for you. And for some, that's completely different than the next person. So I was going to add to that. Too. Sorry, I was going to add to that. And, and it's the compound effect. So yeah, like you have to do a little bit every day and you may not notice the results until maybe six months later. So it, it, it is persistent. So, Marcia, this is a comment that we receive a lot, and I guess my just question here is how would you, what would you tell this person, but, you know, it's difficult to do exercises when you're in a lot of pain. So, what do you say to those kinds of patients? Yeah, so, I, 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 I've been in pain before, too, so I, I definitely can relate, so I empathize with that. So, sometimes um, when you're in pain, sometimes we do exercises called uh, isometric exercises, where um, there's no real movement. You're actually just activating that muscle. So you're just contracting it. So like in sitting down right now, I'm just sort of tightening my abdominals. I'm just tightening them. And that's actually an exercise because I'm contracting my muscles, uh, but I'm not moving. Um, you can do that also in sitting. Um, so that's one kind of exercise you can do um, when you're in pain. Um, another thing too is sometimes you can you can use a, a, an assistive device. So you know if you're having knee pain, um, you can wear a knee brace while you're doing your exercise. Um, uh, and so using or if you're um, if walking is difficult, you can use the Nordic pulse. You can use some sort of uh, assistance with that. Um, and then sometimes the exercise may not necessarily be a strengthening exercise it may be like a relaxation exercise, a deep breathing exercise, something because you're in pain. So you're, you're, you're definitely, um, you know, you're, you're anxious, your muscles are tight, um, you're feeling those symptoms. So it may be uh, lying down um, and sort of like, you know, closing your eyes, uh, breathing into your nose, out your mouth and activating your diaphragm, taking some big, uh, big breaths, trying to calm down your nervous system because it's heightened uh, when you're experiencing that pain. So, Exercise doesn't always look like what you see at the gym. It could be some of these more uh, simpler uh, options for you to pursue. Yeah, what, what I would add to that is exercising the painful joint doesn't have to be the only exercise. So if you exercise, get your heart rate up, general aerobic exercise. Um, so we have individuals who do cardiac rehab because they've had a heart attack or some other issue. They're not exercising their back, but their back pain improves because they're doing something that aerobically stimulates the body, gets things motion as lotion, as Marcia said. So exercising anything that you can do that's low impact and aerobic, aerobic in whatever environment is most comfortable is really the key. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the specific painful joint. And in fact, a half the time you can't start there because it does hurt too much. So you got to keep working around it. So, Marcia, what do we know about acupuncture and whether that can help with arthritis symptoms? Yeah, so um, I, I am acupuncture uh, certified as well. Um, so acupuncture is uh, one of the treatment modalities that I have used uh, with patients. Um, it helps with uh, blood flow. Uh, it helps uh, with muscle spasm. Um, and for certain body parts like the neck, uh, like the knee, uh, there is very good literature to support the use of acupuncture. I usually say, though, it's, it's an adjunct treatment. Um, it's used in conjunction uh, with exercises and stretching. Um, acupuncture alone is not going to get the muscles stronger. It's not going to get the joints more supported. Uh, but it may help to reduce some of your pain. Um, it may help uh, with some of that stiffness. It may help with some of that muscle tightness. Um, and it's used sort of as a supplement to your exercise program that you're doing as well. Yeah, and if, if I can add to that, Sean, 
It brings up a really important point around there's so many treatments out there for arthritis or anything else for that matter. Majority are adjuncts. The key and what all the research shows is that exercise of any variety, but moving and strengthening uh, and finding a way to do that, all the other things should help you do that. So even taking a pain pill, it should be for the purpose of allowing you to function and move and exercise. Same thing with acupuncture, massage therapy, heat, ultrasound. There's a lot of folks who go to therapy places or other practitioners and they're getting these, these treatments. But in the absence of doing an exercise, they often don't work and then it becomes a dependence. Yes, it'll make you feel better for an hour or two or a day, but then it's a repetitive cycle. So it, whenever you use those in those types of things, they should be to help you exercise. And that is the way to sustain your improvement. Um, and, and Marcia made a great point. It's an adjunct, not the primary. It's not going to fix your arthritis. So I don't think you mentioned chiropractic in your list there, Dr. Rampersado or Marcia. Could you comment on whether a chiropractor could help somebody with arthritis symptoms? We both yeah, so, can address this, but go ahead, Marcia. <laughs> I, I was going to say, so So our program, actually, the Rapid Access Clinic for Low Back Pain, um, we're, we're um, advanced practice providers who uh, provide assessments and comprehensive treatment plans for people with back pain. And our clinicians are both uh, physiotherapists and chiropractors who perform these assessments. So really, um, any sort of regulated musculoskeletal uh, provider uh, could be uh, could be used for the assessment and treatment of back uh, and neck arthritic changes. So in the broader sense, manipulative therapy, so manually moving a joint, trying to get it to move, um, is done also by physiotherapists and chiropractor, rapid adjustments, things like that. So there's chiropractory, that's sort of what most people think of, and then there's a whole variety of things. So for us, if you look at the research and the evidence, it doesn't matter who's providing it. There are things that work and things that don't work. And the, the stripe of the individual, the profession of the individual, it's more if using means to allow the person to exercise. So as long as it's combined, if it makes you feel better, um, then it's, it's worth the consideration. So we really agnostic or we don't, it doesn't matter. Who, and then we work in these interprofessional teams all the time. Um, and that often is what some people need. Um, so the approach is very much based on um, the convergence of research shows that doesn't matter if it's chiro, physio, a massage therapist, if it allows you to move and it's move, helping you move the joint it's going to make it better as long as you do your part, right? So changing gears a little bit, Raj, could you explain for people who are hearing cracking, popping sounds in their, in their spine, in their neck, what, what are they hearing? Um, it's, it's not fully known 100%, to be honest, sometimes, sometimes it is in that it's just where tendons or ligaments are sometimes rubbing on either bone spurs or the joint isn't as perfectly smooth as it used to be so that you're feeling that and it, it's amplified because uh, vibrations if you put a vibrating like what we call a tuning fork on your forehead in the bone you'll actually hear it so it's it's the vibrations that's why it sounds sometimes especially when it's coming from your neck it's like oh my god something just broke but it, it, it the noise can be amplified so that's one of one of the issues when it's coming through your skeletal system but it's usually um, um tendons and just not smooth movement of that joint and a lot of folks can quote unquote make their their, their joint grind uh, but as it gets more arthritic so normally it's a perfect rounds round in a circle that can move uh, i think i'm off screen with my fingers but uh versus a, a, a you start to get a square in a circle it's not gonna quite move uh, in a smooth way but if the noise alone without pain essentially is a is, is a not a non uh reason is a re, is not a reason to be worried 
even if it doesn't sound great. It doesn't sound great, and it often doesn't feel great, but doing the exercises and getting that range of motion back, often it's because the muscle is tight and it's just not moving or tracking in a normal way. You can you can actually help it by by getting it exercised and 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 mobile and getting that joint mobile will will actually help. Okay. And Raj, what about people who have had an injury uh, in their youth? And there are a couple of people here wondering if some of the pain they're experiencing now could be early arthritis or arthritis. So could you just comment on that linkage? Yeah, short answer is yes. Um, and so that we know now that arthritis is not just getting old. It's actually much, much more than that. So there are different types of arthritis. There is the getting old type. There's also the what's in this scenario, post-traumatic. So if you injure a joint, if it's a contusion, um, the two pieces of cartilage get hit together, there, there is internal damage that can occur, and that can accelerate the process of arthritis. If the joint or a break happens inside the joint and the joint is uneven, well, when it moves, it's going to accelerate the differential difference in pressure. So there's very, very clear evidence that uh, specific trauma um, can lead to what's called post-traumatic arthritis. Um, and as I said, there are other types of arthritis that can happen in young people. Um, so it often, and it can happen quite quickly. So some people can injure their joint and a, a year later, they're showing signs of early arthritis and all the other joints are fine. If you have arthritis and all your joints are starting to hurt, well, that's not from that one specific injury. That's a different form where it's potentially inflammation, which can affect the whole body. So there are several individuals who have osteoarthritis everywhere. It just, and that's a different beast than the person who wore out their knee playing sports or wore out their hip doing, doing sports or, or any other activity for that matter. Okay, so Marcia, we touched on it a little bit in the presentation, but we've had a few questions here come up about food. So wondering if you could just make a couple comments about what foods would be recommended or not recommended for people with arthritis. Um, so I know uh, Dr. Rampersad talked, talked a little bit about this. So your kind of anti-inflammatory foods are things like your green teas, um, your fatty fishes, like your salmon, your tunas, your mackerels, um, nuts, um, berries, uh, apples, pomegranates, my favorite, dark chocolate, um, <laughs> which would definitely be uh, a good one. Uh, leafy green uh, vegetables, uh, another good one. Um, uh, I'm trying to, oh, turmeric, uh, I'm South Asian, so I should, I should know that one memorized. <laughs> uh, turmeric and, and ginger. Um, um, those are all some of the anti-inflammatory uh, foods that we uh, uh, discuss, whole grains. But the other sort of recommendation is, you know, eat from the periphery of the supermarket. Those tend to be uh, the better foods. The stuff in the aisles are probably uh, not the best for you. So, you know, sticking with your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, uh, your fishes, that's probably uh, a good way to start. Um, and if you have back arthritis, you could probably walk a little bit further uh, using that shopping cart. So you could also do laps around the periphery uh, of the grocery store as well. That's great, thank you. And this is a practical question. Um, many people are concerned about their sleep and I can understand why. So in terms of your leg position, how much should people be bending their knees? Is that a factor in the positions that you were talking about, Marcia? Yeah, so it really depends on, so, so a couple of things with sleep and I talk to this about, I talk with this to patients all the time. So I may start sleeping on my back but I wake up on my side. So sleep is one of those things that you really kind of, as much as you try to get into that perfect position uh, for bed, sometimes it's not sustainable. You just don't have control over it. Um, so it really depends on really what feels good for you. So for some patients uh, sleeping on their side uh, in a fetal position with the knees uh, bent and sort of tucked in actually helps their back. It, it makes them feel better. Uh, for some patients, just lying down, like just lying down takes that pressure off of the back. So they don't necessarily have to bring their knees into their chest. Um, and bringing their knees into their chest aggravates their back. So uh, you have to find a position that works for you, um, whether it be on your back, on your side. 
I usually do find that most patients with arthritis, they do like a sideline position um, or they really like pillows. So I find um, they tell me they use one pillow so that, you know, they don't roll over too much on their shoulder because their shoulder may hurt. So I find that um, most patients do enjoy uh, body pillows so that they can kind of support shoulders uh, as well as knees. Uh, or just a variety of pillows that they can prop up different body parts with or even put underneath their knees if they're lying in a, in a, in a, a supine position. So I'm going to ask one last question, squeeze it in here. We have many people who are experiencing arthritis and many other um, diseases or conditions. One in particular, though, has come up quite a bit, and that is um, people who also have scoliosis. So Dr. Ramprasad, maybe I'll just ask you, is there are any particular advice you would have for people who are living with back arthritis and also scoliosis or considerations that they should have in mind? That's a great point. Um, it's a smaller percentage of the overall, but it's definitely common. Um, so if you look at how many people on the planet have scoliosis, probably 10% have some degree of a curvature to start with. And um, if it's mild, it usually doesn't necessarily cause arthritis, but the, having uh, scoliosis as a child can certainly lead to wear and tear because especially if you're off one way or the other. So if the S in your back is balanced and you're exercising, so the treatment and the approach to it is actually exactly the same as everything we discussed. One of the things as to arthritis and scoliosis is it can actually cause scoliosis even if you never had it before. So those who have scoliosis from a childhood on can definitely get arthritis because of their scoliosis and they have to exercise and keep active and, and probably are more at risk uh, than somebody who doesn't. But some ways, it's like when people have arthritis in their knees, they can have knock knees or bowed legs. or um, And so the spine can also misshape and get scoliosis because of the arthritis process itself. Uh, the treatment approach is exactly the same, but it can sometimes be more difficult to manage the symptoms because they're tilted off-center too much one way or the other, and that's really hard to keep up with. Thank you so much for that, Raj. So I just want to take a moment to thank both of our guests today. We are very fortunate to have them both from the Schroeder Arthritis Institute. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. We You're would welcome. like to take... Yeah, we would like Thank to take just so a few moments. To, you're very welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, we would like to take just a few moments to get the audience's feedback on today's presentation. So for those of you watching on Zoom, you will see two poll questions come up on your screen. So please click the response that reflects your thoughts. <clears throat> Do you think that governments should prioritize reducing the wait times for joint replacement surgeries? Yes or no? We're not sure. And do you feel more knowledgeable and empowered after attending this webinar? <clears throat> we will also be sending you an evaluation form when we email the recording. So if you are unable to access the poll questions, you will have the opportunity to offer feedback at that time. So please do. We use the survey feedback to shape our future Arthritis Talks webinars, and we really truly value your input. Once again, I have to thank our partners, Pfizer and United Way Winnipeg for their support of this event. Initiatives such as this webinar are supported by our valued sponsors and donors, including those who have generously left a gift in their will to the Arthritis Society. You may not know that May is Leave a Legacy Month and we encourage you to learn more about how you can plan a gift in your will to help us continue essential pro programming like this in the future. So visit arthritis.ca slash plan giving to learn more. Our next webinar, Arthritis Talks, Assistive Devices for Arthritis, is coming up on Wednesday, June 8th. So to register for that event, visit arthritis.ca slash arthritis talks. This concludes Arthritis Talks, Arthritis in the Back and Neck. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us today, and please stay well. <laughs>